Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is our uh, COVID-19 briefing for Thursday, November the 4th. Uh, we're honoured to be here on the territory of Lekwungen-speaking people of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. I wanted to start by, of course, um, sending uh, our best and our support uh, to Premier Horgan on his diagnosis today, which he spoke about today, or or made a statement about today. Uh, I've had the occasion in the last uh, few days to speak to uh, Premier Horgan and talk to him about a number of things, including obviously uh, his personal health, but also about the Canada Health Transfer, which he's passionate about, and all of the issues in healthcare and other areas that Premier Horgan is passionate about. And uh, uh, he is, of course, uh, determined and positive and thoughtful. And uh, as someone who has uh, dealt with cancer and survived before. He understands both, uh, I think, the challenges, but also uh, he's engaging with real optimism. I'm, uh, I think the qualities that make him uh, a great premier, but also a great friend and uh, a really great human being are going to help him in this, as are the supportive people, I think, uh, across the political spectrum and people of BC. And I think Premier Horgan has, in particular, talked to me about um, about his appreciation of the extraordinary work of healthcare workers. You know, we did in the two weeks I'll be reporting on this later uh, uh, about 11,500 uh, uh, surgeries in the two reporting periods during two public health emergencies. And the work of healthcare workers across the board is exceptional. The Premier, I know, uh, appreciates that every day and no more so than today, as do we all. We're all thinking uh, of you, Premier Horton. I don't know if he's watching today, but thinking about him uh, and sending you our support and our love. And uh, with that, it's my honour to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Uh, today, um, as well, I want to start by wishing everybody a, a happy Diwali and Bandar Chor Divas. I know this is an important time to celebrate triumph over hope and despair and, and the coming of light over darkness. And that is something that uh, all of us can um, think through and be part of. And uh, as we heard the news today about Premier Horgan and his cancer diagnosis, I also want to extend my my thoughts and happy thoughts because I know uh, the Premier and his family are are taking this on with a uh, positive and strength and they will be strong and positive through uh, throughout this and uh, we're sending our best wishes as well and and also to our many healthcare workers and families across this province who are dealing with similar issues. All of our healthcare workers in BC who continue to go to work every day to provide that care for people across the province and the very best care possible. And my gratitude goes to you as well. So today I'm also going to be providing uh, the latest epidemiology data and modeling update um, to give a little bit of a sense of where we are here on November 4th in this pandemic. So to go back to some of the, the uh, images that will be familiar to people who have watched these updates over the last year and a half or almost 21 months now. Uh, this is uh, the epi week of uh, last week, so ending on Saturday. Uh, and it shows where we are seeing the most cases. So it's the case rate by local health area of residents of the people who are infected. And what we see is that we still continue to have challenges across the north. No surprise to people in many communities in the north. On a positive note, we are seeing cases come down quite dramatically in interior health, which is great news, and remaining low, particularly in those areas of the province where our vaccination rates have provided that buffer where the virus can't spread as easily. We continue to be affected across the entire province, and this is a cumulative case rate um, since the 1st of January in 2020 up until the end of October. And some areas have been more impacted than others, but there is no community in this province that has not been affected by this pandemic. And I don't need to say that to people here today. Uh, on a positive note as well, what we see is the geographic distribution of vaccination coverage, and that has 
um, become increasingly high. And our coverage now is up to uh, over 90%. This is age 12 and above for first dose coverage. What we also can see is that in those areas where coverage is not as high, in those pockets where vaccination rates are not as high, those correspond to areas where we see uh, increasing transmission. And I've just put the lower mainland uh, up as an example where we can see this side by side. If we look at the coverage rates in, in the lower mainland in the Fraser East region, those are the areas where we still see persistently high case rates. And as we'll see as the data goes on, uh, where we're seeing people hospitalized um, from this virus. This is our epidemic curve uh, starting in uh, January 1st to the 1st of November this year. As you can see um, the green line on the top, we've had grumbling cases along for the last few months since that uh, rapid increase driven interior health in the, in, uh, the summer. Uh, we are seeing a, a, a steady decrease, particularly in the last couple of weeks with the, uh, imp uh, the, impl uh, the putting in of new measures in, in particularly in northern health. What is concerning on this is the persistently high, stubbornly high rates of hospitalization. And we'll look a little bit deeper into who is being hospitalized and why and where in some of the data that I'll present now. This has been the challenge for us over this last few months. It has been the reason why we've done things like uh, making sure that healthcare workers are vaccinated, making sure that we get booster doses out to where we're seeing um, people having breakthrough infections. Um, but it is uh, also a reflection of the fact that the Delta virus is spreading more easily and causing more severe illness in younger people, particularly those who don't have the protection of vaccination. So if we compare, for example, our cases and hospitalizations in people who are unvaccinated versus fully vaccinated, the difference is stark. This really is um, driven by the number of people who are becoming infected, who have not yet been vaccinated, and the hospitalizations reflect that as well. If we look across the province, this is uh, the uh, case incidence, so the, the number of cases, test positivity, and that the colors reflect the percent, the rolling, uh, seven day rolling average percent positivity, and the testing rate. And the testing rate, we say uh, across the board, has remained high. And what we are starting to see in some of those stubbornly high areas is an, a now a decrease in the percent positivity and the case incidence rate, particularly in some of the areas of the interior, and now just more recently in the north and the northeast and northwest in particular. This is the epidemic curve by Health Authority, and we can see that Fraser Health still has the bulk of the cases, although this last wave has been driven uh, initially by a rapid increase of cases in interior health that have finally now started to settle down, and of course um, the recent cases that we're seeing across the north. When we break this down by age, we uh, last time we presented the update of the epidemiologic data, we were right as the uh, 9 to 11 and 5 to 8 year old age group was going up. As we can see, it has dramatically come down, and I'll show you a little bit more data about the school age children a bit later, showing that our testing rates still remain high in that population. So this is a true decrease, and it's related again to decreases in communities um, that is reflected in in the, in the uh, rates that we're seeing in school-aged children, and particularly in those children who are not yet old enough to be vaccinated. Finally, we're also seeing a decrease across the board, with the exception of people over the age of 80. And where we're seeing this is people who are um, infected in some of the long-term care outbreaks that we're seeing, but also community uh, seniors in our communities, who um, particularly the small number who are not yet vaccinated, and the risk in that group is very, very high. So if we break again uh, the age uh, distributions out by vaccination or not vaccinated, um, it really is a predominantly unvaccinated population where we're seeing infections take off and where we're seeing higher rates of, of uh, infections in uh, the younger age groups. Um, thankfully, the youngest age group, the 0 to 11, who are not yet eligible for vaccination, have the lowest rates and those rates have been coming down. 
When we look again at hospitalization, so the numbers of people in hospital in the top and the rate per 100,000 on the bottom, we see again that in uh, younger people, 0 to 19 year age group, that that remains low. And this is something that we have been following, of course, since the summer in particular, uh, when we started to see increased rates of children being hospitalized in the States and in some parts of the country. Thankfully, we have not seen that here. And we know that part of that is protection that's afforded by those around young children being vaccinated and by the measures we've taken to protect young children. Where we see the rates going up, as I mentioned, in people over the age of 80. And some of that is related to breakthrough infections in people who are fully vaccinated. And we know that happens because our immune systems aren't as strong as we're older, as we get older. And because they were at the highest risk, our seniors and elders have always been disproportionately affected during this pandemic. And we prioritize people over age 80 to be immunized early on. And many people received uh, their immunization at a shorter interval. And we now know that that extended interval between dose one and dose two does indeed, as we expected, give longer lasting, stronger protection. So this is one of the reasons we have prioritized people over the age of 70 um, across the board to receive booster doses. And that has started in the past week. This is just an update again of, of the impact of the pandemic across the age groups. We can see that younger people under the age of 10 are still underrepresented compared to the proportion of younger people in, uh, in the population and that the main burden of this virus and the pandemic has been on people over the age of 50 and particularly people over the age of 70. When we look at vaccination progress, we can see that we've made tremendous progress across the board. So we are at about 90% coverage of people over the age of 12, and that is fantastic. But it also reflects that that small percentage of people left is uh, still has a tremendous burden on our health care system. And if we look at all ages, so our entire population, we're about 80% of the entire population that's been um, protected through vaccination. And we see in, in communities where those vaccination rates are high, how protective that is at preventing uh, the virus from spreading, even if it cause, cause mild illness in some people. So when we look at then the proportion of people who are unvaccinated, who become cases, about 60% of, of the people who were infected with COVID in the month of October are from that 10% of people who are not yet vaccinated. And the vast majority of hospitalizations, 72% in the month of October, and over 90% of the people who required critical care are people who are not yet vaccinated. When it comes to the small number, thankfully, of people who've died from COVID, uh, about half of those people are not yet vaccinated, mostly younger people, whereas uh, we know that this virus can still have devastating effects on older people in long-term care homes if it gets into that setting. And this is, a, this is a summary, we call it our placemat, of uh, looking at the vaccination rates um, in the, on the, across the top. And then that small gray portion, the percentage that uh, result in cases. And, and on the right-hand side, the bars show the age. So what we see is that the number of cases in people who are unvaccinated at a younger age is much higher. And importantly, the hospitalizations on the third row down, we are seeing unvaccinated young people being hospitalized and sadly have seen deaths in young people who are unvaccinated. Most of the uh, hospitalizations and the, the uh, deaths in people who are fully vaccinated are in those who are older with underlying conditions whose immune systems aren't as strong and able to um, prevent severe illness if they do have breakthrough cases. But really, what we look at by age, the, the, you can see the dramatic impact of, of protection that vaccination gives across the age span. That purple line that's relatively flat on the bottom is, is consistent across the age groups that these vaccines are highly, highly protective at preventing severe illness, even in older people who get infected. And this is uh, really putting it all together. 
when we look at it by age. So this is adjusted for age. For So a 50-year-old person who is unvaccinated has a 10 times increased risk of a same age person who's been fully vaccinated of becoming infected with COVID. The risk of hospitalization is 50 times greater than somebody the same age who's been immunized and 46 times greater risk that they're going to um, succumb to COVID than somebody who's been protected through vaccination. These are the important things that help us understand how well these vaccines are working and how they are protecting people. I want to talk a little bit more about the pediatric groups of our, our children, uh, particularly school-age children and uh, young children. We've been following this very closely, as we've mentioned. Um, so in the past epidemiologic week, we've had one additional case admitted to hospital um, in the 0 to 4, 5 to 11, and 12 to 17, one each in those age groups. And there's been two children, one in the 5 to 11 age group and another child, 12 to 17, who've been admitted to critical care. We've had no additional deaths in any of these uh, ages, which is good news for all of us. Um, if we break it down again by geography and age to help a better understanding of who, uh, where children are being infected and, and at what age, we see that it does vary tremendously by the rates of transmission in the community. And again, those reflect the rates of vaccination in our communities. So we see in the interior in the 12 to 17 age group where immunization rates have come up quite dramatically in many communities that we've seen a steady decrease in uh, cases uh, in uh, children in the, uh, that who are vaccinated. As well, um, we're starting to see the corner turn in Northern Health as immunization rates go up. But it still um, shows us that the impact is much more felt in communities where vaccination rates are lower. And again, breaking this down by um, un unvaccinated versus vaccinated, uh, particularly in the 12 to 17, I think this is really important for us to, to realize. Hospitalizations are low across the board for children. That is good. That's important for us to know. But there have been no hospitalizations, none in the past month um, since July in fully vaccinated youth. So children at 12 to 17 who have been protected by vaccination, it is working extremely well. We've had very few cases and we've had no hospitalizations. That's important for us to think about as vaccines are now becoming available for the, the younger age group as well. And this is just to um, show that we are continuing to test at very high levels. So we are looking for um, cases in young people across the spectrum and the rates and the percent positivities are coming down dramatically. So that's uh, important for us to remember as well. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about our update on our modeling. So this is the uh, reproductive number, RT, and for the first time in several months, across the board we've come dipped down below one. What we have been seeing is sort of bouncing around at one which means for every person who, who's infected they infect one other person on average. Now we're seeing that below one. That's good news but it's just below one which means that we have right now a fragile balance. We're going down slowly. It is important for us to recognize that the things that we're doing to prevent transmission, including being sure we're vaccinated, getting our booster doses, staying away from others if we're feeling sick ourselves, um, managing the size of our gatherings, particularly if people are unvaccinated in those settings. These are all the things that are making a difference right now. But we are going into the respiratory season. We've started to see influenza appear on a horizon. We have started to see uh, RSV cause some infections, particularly in children. So this is not the time to let off in any way what we are doing to protect ourselves, our families and our communities. And uh, finally, the uh, modeling, the transmission scenarios that we've been using, as uh, we talked about the last time we presented this, we're uh, looking at the shorter term um, implications given what we've seen in the past about modeling. And on the right hand side, it talks about hospitalizations and uh, 
sorry, on the, on the left hand side, uh, hospitalizations on the right hand side cases. And where we are right now, we should continue to see a steady decline in cases and hospitalizations over the next month. But this is a fragile balance that we're in. But it is an important balance. And when we look at what we could be at had we not had vaccination right now, we would have been in a very different situation in this province. And you know, people have asked, you know, what is it that's keeping the hospitalization rates up? Why is there so many cases in transmission? And part of the answer is the strain of the virus that's circulating right now is that much more transmissible and is causing more severe illness in younger people and in people who aren't vaccinated. And if we had not had the protection of immunization that we have had across the province, we would have had a much more challenging situation. So that's the update right now. And what does this tell us overall? That the risk is and continues to be dramatically higher for people who are not yet vaccinated. And I know that you've heard me say this, we've heard the minister say this over and over, but this is showing us how important and how protective and effective the vaccines that we have are. This is now a preventable disease, particularly severe illness hospitalizations. Our seniors and elders continue to be vulnerable and that is why we've rolled out the vaccine um, booster dose to them um, so quickly right now and we know that uh, we'll get to booster doses. We've uh, managed all of our long-term care, assisted living and um, people in the community are receiving their invites now to get your booster dose and I encourage you to get this now. We're also focusing on healthcare workers who were immunized early, particularly those who had it at a reduced interval in December and January last year, um, because we know how important it is to protect you from any illness, even mild illness, because it can be so disruptive to our system. And while the North is continues to be more severely impacted right now, We've seen clusters and peaks in different areas across the province. And there's been no part of, of the province that has been unaffected by this, as we know. As well, we know what's happening in the north is having spillover in the hospital stretched uh, systems across the province. Once restrictions are in place that limit for the potential for the virus to spread, and we see that in the north, we start to stabilize and come down. This is important. The number of new cases um, per, for every, uh, on average for every case is now below one, but it's just below one. And this is where we need to keep it. We all need to continue to do the things. Our collective efforts are making a difference to slow the spread and to reduce the impact on our communities and our hospitals. So how do we stay on track? These are the, the five things I'm asking everybody to to continue to do as we go through this next few months. Get your booster dose when it's your turn. Get your first and second dose now. These will protect you, protect your family, protect the people you're closest to. Get your influenza vaccine. This will help us to, to weather the influenza season and we don't know how that's going to turn out but we've started to see some transmission. Register your younger children and get them vaccinated. When we have vaccine available in the coming weeks, um, it will be important to protect them as well. And we are working to provide all of the information to parents so you can make those choices for your children. Remember how important it is now more than ever to stay home if you're feeling unwell, to stay away from others, to get tested if you need to, but all of those important things that we have been doing all along, washing our hands, staying away from others if we're feeling sick, and wearing masks in indoor public spaces when we're around other people and we don't know their vaccination status. I want to start, finish by saying thank you, everybody who's doing your part. It has made a difference and we're continuing to make a difference. And we all need to remember that that is what is going to get us through this next few months and to the light and to a better and brighter few months ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Henry. Um, and just to underline um, uh, the age-adjusted 
uh, number 50 times more likely to be in hospital if you're unvaccinated. 50 times. And I think it's important to reflect on that and why it's important that we did, I think, approximately 3,000 first-time, first doses in the last reporting period of vaccination and why we need, continue to need to drive vaccination amongst the unvaccinated, particularly in some regions, but really across in every part of BC, from the central part of Vancouver Island to the north to other areas where there are um, significant rates of transmission today. I'm going to provide an update on surgeries and postponements on mandatory vaccination for BC's healthcare workers and booster doses in long-term care and assisted living. With respect to mandatory vaccinations for healthcare workers, approximately 2% remain unvaccinated. That's 3,091 workers total and by health authorities. That's 573 in Fraser Health, 959 in Interior Health, 306 in Northern Health, 101 in Providence Healthcare, 399 at the Provincial Health Services Authority, uh, 33 in Vancouver Coastal Health, and 485 in Island Health. I think that's actually a mistake. In Vancouver Coastal Health, we'll get you that number. I'll note that um, I'll note that we're going to provide a breakdown tomorrow of some major occupation groups to give you a sense. But I'll tell you that there is not really significant differences between occupation groups. All of them uh, do extremely well. Uh, are close to our either uh, are largely 97 and 98 percent all of our major occupation groups through the healthcare system. We we'll make this point though, and I think it's important to recognize um, how positively people have responded to the provincial health order with respect to mandatory vaccination. You will recall um, on October 20th when we spoke about this and gave you the numbers for the first time. The numbers of, uh, of uh, unvaccinated workers in our health care system was 5,512. There has been, of course, some data cleanup since then, but also a lot of people have got vaccinated. And the results are a health care system that's safer for workers, safer for patients, safer for families, safer for the community. And I'm very proud of everyone who's been involved in that. I also want to note just um, uh, something similar with respect to the previous, the order that uh, was in place on October the 12th for long-term care and assisted living workers by sharing the following statistics. That on August 12th, um, 2021, when, the, uh, when Dr. Henry announced the intention to proceed with mandatory vaccination amongst long-term care workers and assisted living workers, the number of staff vaccinated on that date was 45,357, or 90.1%. That number to yesterday on November 3rd was 48,598 healthcare workers, or 96.5%. So that's an increase of 3,241 net in count and 6.4% in percentage. For second doses, those increases were 5,495 and 10.9%. What it says is what we know that this order is necessary and important and has made our healthcare system safer for everybody. And we are, of course, going to continue to proceed uh, with um, this uh, requirement throughout our healthcare system in the interests of everybody, but in particular for those working in the system and for those who need uh, healthcare at, these, at this difficult and challenging time. And we're going to, of course, continue to work with health authorities to address the impacts from unvaccinated staff. I wanted, uh, but I would say this that the biggest risk to a health human resources is COVID-19. And these actions, these clear actions, to make things safer and better are good for everybody, in particularly for those who work in the system, and as I say, vulnerable patients and residents. I wanted to uh, provide an update on efforts to protect those living in long-term care and seniors assisted living. Um, booster dose vaccination is 98% complete in long-term care and seniors assisting facilities across the province. With 526 of 536 facilities receiving their booster dose to date, that's 100% of sites in Vancouver Coastal, Northern Health and Fraser Health, 94% uh, in Island Health, that will be finished in the next day, and 98% of the sites in Interior Health. And finally, um, as we reported on Monday across BC, uh, most operating rooms continue to perform surgeries, although there have been, as I've noted, reductions. 
as many will remember when we started our weekly surgical reports, when all non-urgent surgeries were suspended across the province back in uh, March and April of 2020, we noted that in addition to scheduled surgeries being postponed, others were not booked during this time. And on a much smaller scale, that's what's happening now. What we said in May 2020 when we launched our surgical renewal commitment stands true today. Our commitment is to catch up with surgeries lost to COVID-19 and keep up with demand for surgeries now and in the future. No matter what challenges we face, this remains our commitment and we will see it through. And as we have week after week since we made our surgical renewal commitment, we will monitor our progress and report on our efforts in fulfilling that commitment. And with that, here's this week's report. You'll recall that, uh, uh, or I should say that during the reporting period of October 24th to 30th, health authorities postponed 238 non-urgent scheduled surgeries. That's 31 in Fraser Health, 12 in Northern Health, 61 in Vancouver Coastal Health, 71 in Vancouver Island Health, uh, and, uh, and uh, no surgeries were, uh, oh, 61, sorry, in Interior Health, and no surgeries were postponed in the Provincial Health Services Authority. From September 5th to October 30th, there have now been 2,389 surgical postponements. I want to note this. In the period from October 2nd to 9th, uh, 7,004 surgeries were completed in that week, which is, I think, a significant achievement and really similar to some of the highest levels of surgeries we had in the pre-pandemic period. And this is an extraordinary achievement given the challenges in acute care. It shows how hard and how determined our staff is in providing care to people. From October 10th to October 16th, health authorities report 5,582 surgeries were completed. I'll note that that, uh, that, uh, that week included Thanksgiving, so there was uh, a statutory holiday in that week, which is the, responsible for the largest share of the, of the lesser number than the previous week, but it's also a significant achievement. So when you look at the numbers of surgeries canceled in a week or postponed in a week of 200 and those completed, in the week of October uh, 2nd to 9th, 7,000, you'll see the, that overwhelmingly people are getting both for non-urgent scheduled surgeries and of course in all cases of urgent scheduled surgeries, the care they need. Let's say finally about our healthcare system and where we sit. Right now um, we have, as all of you know from these briefings, um, 9,229 acute care beds, base beds in our province, and 2,353 surge beds. We have 510 base ICU beds and 218 surge beds. And just to give you a sense of where we are right now, of those 11,582 beds, the 9,229 base beds are our census. That means everyone in healthcare today, which is a key number that we use in monitoring our system, is 9,199. So it's under our base bed capacity and under where we were in the pre-pandemic period, but still extremely challenging given the particular challenges of COVID-19. In, uh, in ICU beds, uh, our uh, we have 480 beds occupied today out of the 510 base beds. Of course, there are 728 base and surge beds. That gives you a sense of where it is. Uh, where those numbers are. It shows a healthcare system that is delivering an enormous amount of, uh, in terms of services for people, of surgeries and of care for people, and at the same time is challenged by two public health emergencies. And, and finally, I'd just say this, 100 people now have been transferred, ICU patients have been transferred from the north to other health authorities. Since Halloween, since Sunday, nine more have been transferred, six from the two Peace River local health areas. And what this tells us, what Dr. Henry's modeling tells us, is the absolute need to continue to increase our dose one vaccination and our dose two vaccination in addition to getting your um, booster doses when you are invited to do so. This is absolutely critical. Every one of those cases requires people being supported by healthcare teams at every stage of their journey. And of course, people who are, who are, are in facing serious health difficulties far from home. It fills me with awe for our healthcare workers in our communities and the work that communities are doing together to increase vaccination rates from Mayor Ackerman and Fort St. John to, to uh, MLAs, but mostly just to people in the community. We're seeing those rates go up more than 76% now, for example, in Fort St. John and going up. 
I'm in awe of them and of our healthcare workers. We're determined. Everyone in the healthcare system is determined to support the North. 18% test positivity against 4% for the rest of the province. We must support the North and we are determined to continue to do that through the BCCDC in supporting contact tracing and through the entire healthcare system in supporting patients in the North. But also I would say real sadness because the vast majority of people who have been transferred are dealing with COVID-19. Some have other ailments and other problems and other illnesses which they are being supported for and we, we need to provide outstanding care. But it is preventable. It is preventable. And I want to say to everyone today, look at the numbers, but imagine those, the, the people involved who did not get vaccinated or in a community far from home getting assistance in breathing. It's time for everyone, everywhere in BC, to get vaccinated against COVID-19. Thank you. We're happy to take your questions. A reminder to reporters on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. Our first question today goes to Richard Zussman, Global News. Richard, please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Henry, what I'm struggling to get my head around is this uh, almost 50% of those who have died in the last month uh, were vaccinated against COVID-19. Can you walk us through the pre-existing health conditions, the impacts of age, whether this was predominantly long-term care, and someone seeing those numbers that's over the age of 70 or 80 who's vaccinated in this province, what should they be thinking? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. The number one risk factor for having severe illness or dying from COVID is age. Always has been, continues to be. Um, the best thing that we can do to protect people at any age is vaccination. But as we get older, our response to, to vaccination is not as strong. Our immune system doesn't mount as strong as a response or as long a lasting response. So we are seeing breakthrough in some people in the community in particular, um, as we see over age 70, over age 80. So it is the people around our elders and seniors who also need to be protected through vaccination because if they get infected, the risk of having more severe illness is that much higher and that leads to um, people ending up in hospital and sadly to people dying. So it, it is that combination, but the, most people as we get older, we're much more likely to have underlying illness as well. Um, other things that may put us at risk. But a good proportion of those cases are in those high risk settings in long term care and assisted living, um, but also in communities where we have large numbers of uh, uh, multi generational families, people living in, in uh, uh, houses together where there's crowding, where we can't effectively isolate from each other. And we have seen that in some communities where it gets into uh, the population. Uh, we know there's been some uh, large uh, events that have happened in a community and that has led to transmission. And when, it, um, when people are exposed to this virus that's circulating right now um, in an intense uh, situation like that, particularly in long-term care, it can still spread. And for most people, it still causes a very mild illness, but that risk goes up as you get older. So if we look at people over age 80, um, very high immunization rates. And so those deaths reflect the small number of people that uh, are still susceptible and the fact that the people around them, um, they've been exposed to this virus and their chances of getting severely ill and dying is just that much greater. Richard, do you have a follow-up? Is there any advice to those 70 plus about how they should be living their lives now if they are immunized, especially now that we have flu season coming upon us? And, and with this strain of the flu, are we worried that this is going to impact older people? Uh, separately, are we worried this is impacting younger people? So, you know, what are we seeing with the flu and, and what should people over the age of 70 do if they are immunized in terms of making decisions about how they're living their lives? 
Yeah, so I think for, for people who have um, immune systems that uh, that aren't as strong, so immune compromised because you're going through cancer treatments or because of age, we still need to take those precautions. And, it, and, and that includes wearing masks, it includes staying away from others who are non-immunized, particularly in those crowded indoor settings where we don't know the people around us. And I know this is hard, but we need to take those precautions through this respiratory season because yes, there are other things. And, and of course, for people over age 70, that is why we're rolling out booster doses. That will help. That will give you that little bit of extra protection that's going to carry you through this next few months and, and hopefully much longer than that. Um, but it's not 100%. And for people who are at that highest risk, you still need to do those things that you would do normally um, through a respiratory season about being cautious, about being around people who are unvaccinated, being around settings where the virus can still spread quite easily. Um, for the rest of us, it also means we have to be aware of older people in our lives and the risk that they may have. So making sure that we Take that option of meeting outside if we're not feeling 100%. Staying away and having a remote visit if, we're, uh, if we or the other family members aren't feeling well. And making sure that you only have vaccinated people that are in uh, indoor gatherings around people. What we do, we don't have enough influenza yet to know exactly. We've had, uh, I believe it's 1B and 3As of two different, uh, one is the AH1N1 and the other was an H3N2. Um, so we don't yet know. We know that the H3N2 does um, more, cause more severe illness in older people uh, on, in general, and that the Bs and the H1N1 tend to uh, cause illness in younger people. Um, so it's too early to tell. Uh, we do know the, that uh, so far the strains that we're seeing are in the vaccine and that uh, the vaccine this year is a quadrivalent, so it has both Bs and two As. So I encourage everybody to go out and uh, get vaccinated. It is free for everybody. Um, over the age of six months, we don't have a vaccine uh, for influenza and, and people under the age of uh, in infants under six months. Um, but everybody else can get vaccinated this year and that will help protect you from that one other um, respiratory virus that causes outbreaks in long-term care homes. It causes outbreaks in schools. It causes outbreaks in our health care system every year. So we don't need that on top of what we're dealing with continually with, with COVID this year. Next question, Sinjin Alexander, CTV. Please go ahead. Hi, Dr. Henry. Uh, keeping on with what Richard was asking about flu shots, there's been a few signs around town, just anecdotally people talking to us that, sorry, we're out of flu shots, sorry, out of flu shots. Any concern there that there aren't enough flu shots out there for everyone who needs them? Uh, no concerns that I know of yet. Well, these are things that we do monitor and, and actually we can get some updates next week about uh, where we are with flu shots. We're delivering, a lot of them are going to pharmacies this year directly and uh, our partners in the pharmacies are uh, ready and able to give flu shots as well as uh, public health clinics, but uh, um, we're relying on our pharmacy partners for a lot of that this year. Just, just to say, Sinjin, that we, we got uh, 2.4 million doses of uh, flu shot this year. Just to, by comparison, that's compared to 1.5 million doses uh, um, uh, two years ago. So we are, we are preparing for a major campaign. It's going on right now. Uh, last year, the vast majority of those flu shots were delivered in community pharmacy, and I expect that to be the case this, this year. We're full on. Um, there are more than a million shots out there in community uh, vaccines, I should say, doses out there uh, right now. So there's a lot of vaccine out there and we have, we believe, uh, more than, uh, than uh, is required to ensure that everyone can get a flu shot, remind people to get it done. It's free and it's good uh, for everybody. And, uh, and we encourage everyone to do that. But this is uh, a record year. Um, everyone made sure of it. That was a real commitment of public health this year to make sure that we had enough flu shots for everyone. So there was no question about that. And we encourage everyone to get involved. And uh, next Tuesday at our briefing, we'll be also briefing on the number of people who've re received flu shots already. And then we'll do that successively through the months, uh, the end of November and into December. Sinjin, do you have a follow-up? 
I do. Thank you both for that. Uh, the follow-up is uh, for Shannon Patterson. I'm sure, Dr. Henry, you've heard that two of the biggest school districts in the province, and several others actually, are deciding against the vaccine mandate, and it looks like others are following. Your thoughts on the potential, Dr. Henry, that no school district will have this mandate in the province? Yeah, well, from the very beginning, uh, we've provided advice to school districts about the things that they need to consider. And that is, uh, I know it's uh, nine points, I believe. Uh, and it is important that each school district look at the impact that they're seeing within their own area. And I know uh, my colleagues in the local public health units, uh, the school MHOs have been working with their school districts to make sure that the actions that are taken reflect the, the risk in those school communities. So. I obviously am very strongly supportive of making sure that everybody who's eligible, all of the staff in our school system are, are vaccinated um, as the best protection for them and to make sure that we can keep our schools running and keep our children from getting sick as well. Um, but I, I also know that the vaccination rates are very high in many of the uh, many of the school districts and that's one of the first things that people have to consider. Where are vaccination rates? Where are you seeing transmission right now? And I know uh, my colleagues have been working with their school districts to make sure that that's reflected in the decisions that are made at that local level. Next question, Zhao Zhu, Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Dr. Henry. Uh, yeah, also on the uh, vaccine mandates in schools, uh, the education minister has said the province would not make a move to require vaccine uh, vaccine uh, because your office has not deemed it a requirement. You also mentioned that um, uh, uh, the vaccinations are pretty high among teachers, but the government told us it does not have rates in individual school districts. So uh, why do teachers not marry the same levels of workplace safety as someone working in a government office or on a ferry? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I think what the minister meant to say was that there's not a PHO order around schools, as there is not for other um, employment, uh, private industries, for other businesses, for other uh, areas. I have provided advice, and my advice is that uh, workplace safety is important, and the safety of, uh, of staff in the school system is important, that each employer needs to look at how do they best uh, have a safe environment for employees. And uh, in this case, that's the school districts who are the employers, and that is part of their responsibility, and public health is providing them advice around that. But I absolutely agree with you. I think that it is an important consideration. It is a workplace safety issue, as well as an important uh, function to make sure that our com school communities are supported. Zhao, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, yeah, according to a, late, a letter sent to parents from the Langley School District, the board says Fraser Health uh, said a vaccine mandate may not impact transmission and may impact operations such as staffing. Uh, how can you uh, explain to parents that authorities and business have concluded a vaccine mandate is required to uh, ensure safety in all sorts of uh, workplaces, including the legislature, but that an overall high rate of vaccination among teachers means a mandate should not be required. And uh, if vaccinations are really high, why would there be concerns at all about uh, losing staff? Thanks. Yeah, so uh, as I said, these are uh, issues that each employer works through with their uh, uh, situation in their community, given the vaccination rates in the community, given their relationship, their understanding of who's vaccinated in their, uh, amongst their employees. And our advice has remained that they need to look at all of the, the positive and negative impacts of a vaccine mandate. They have to understand uh, the vaccination rates in their community in their schools, in their employees. And, and that remains the same. And I have provided the same advice as I have to the public service agency, that these are the things that they as employers need to look at. And uh, the importance of immunization in protecting workers in the workplace, in protecting everybody else who is in that, uh, in that school or in that setting as well. And I'm very strongly supportive of making sure that we have uh, high rates of immunization that are protective in the, in the workplace. And we also know that there are additional measures that are working to protect schools. So 
So each school district has to balance what they're seeing within their schools. And we've pre presented some of the data already that shows that those other measures are working and that uh, we're not seeing uh, large outbreaks in transmission in schools in many of these communities where those decisions have been made. So they have to balance that risk benefit. It's a different situation when we're talking about healthcare. And we have seen the impact of having even small numbers of unvaccinated healthcare workers. But it doesn't mean we give up all of the other things that we are doing in the healthcare system as well. So it is important to continue using personal protective equipment, making sure that we have things in place that prevent transmission of infections, as well as making sure that everybody in those settings are immunized because the risk of introducing the virus virus into both the workplace and those we care for in our care settings is just that much higher. And we continue to see outbreaks. We're seeing outbreaks um, related to unvaccinated staff members in acute care, in long-term care homes, and we've seen the devastating impacts that those can have. So it is a different situation and every workplace and uh, every employer needs to look at the situation that they are facing and what measures they have in place to protect people in their situation. Next question, Camille Baines, Canadian Press. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for Minister Dix. Uh, I'd like to know uh, with Ontario and Quebec about faith on mandatory vaccination for healthcare workers, what can you say about where uh, BC may go with its own policy? Because a considerable number of uh, these employees do remain unvaccinated. Yeah, I, I will start with that because it is my order, and uh, we are we have very strong support, and I um, cannot be more proud of my colleagues in healthcare across this province. And uh, we talked a little bit about the impact that we're seeing, but we've recognized how important it is to protect our healthcare system, to protect each other, but to protect the people we serve and the people we care for. And we are committed to doing that. We've been working with our colleges, our regulatory colleges, and with uh, healthcare workers across this province. And I think we have uh, a very strong, committed healthcare workforce that are vaccinated because they know the value of protecting themselves, their families, and the patients that we care for. Uh, I, I just think it's just plainly the right decision. It doesn't mean it's an easy decision, but it's plainly the right decision. You've seen since the orders came forward and implemented, we've seen a, a significant uptick in vaccination and people are safer. It means that in long-term care and assisted living today, 100% of the workers are vaccinated. It means to visit someone in long-term care and assisted living, you have to be vaccinated. It means that all residents, there's a few care homes still left to be done, but all residents have been offered their third dose immunization from COVID-19. And after the year we've had and the impact of outbreak, and yes, some of our outbreaks have been very, are very significant. You think of Willingdon, uh, care center, you think of Cottonwoods Care Center in different parts of the province right now. The majority of our outbreaks are less. But when an outbreak it occurs, it profoundly affects the lives of everyone in the facility, the staff, of course, but primarily the residents who are separated from one another, who don't do the same social activities. This is their home, who can't receive visitors in the same way in a very challenging time. And so this is an absolutely necessary order to protect the lives and safety of healthcare workers and of, uh, of, re of residents in long-term care. Equally in acute care, we see the same thing. And this is supported, I think, across the board, uh, I think, in communities, the need to ensure that healthcare workers are safe and are protected. Across categories of workers, we've seen, uh, we see 98% immunization across 127,000 people who serve us in acute care and in the community directly for health authorities. 127,000 workers, 98% first dose immunization, 96% completed um, second dose immunization in that number. That gap is closing every day. So this is the right thing to do. It is necessary to protect everybody. It is of course challenging and difficult but the main challenge in our healthcare settings is COVID-19 itself and its impact when it comes in those settings. 
And, and so we think that this is the right approach. I think people support this approach. And it's one that is pro-healthcare worker, and it's pro-patient, and it's pro-resident, and it allows us together to deal with a pandemic that affects healthcare in particular more than anything else. Camille, do you have a follow-up? Yes, thank you. Uh, for health authorities where there are higher numbers of healthcare workers that aren't getting vaccinated, how will you deal with that? Well, across the board, and, and the minister can talk about this too, but for every single individual healthcare worker, we're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. And, uh, and the largest number is in interior health, and that is happening um, to make sure we understand why and make sure people have access, that their questions are answered, that we support them in um, being immunized. And uh, that is happening right now. And every day we're seeing more and more people coming um, on board and making sure that this is uh, something that they're doing as a part of a, a healthcare profession. And, and just to say with respect to long-term care and assisted living, one of the uh, advantages in that, in that area is the 6,000 people we've added to the care teams in the last year uh, across the programs we've introduced to in terms of infection control and care. The fact that we've significantly added resources and still it is an enormous challenge particularly when a care home faces an outbreak and people are not able to come to work either because they're sick or because of their contacts and that has a profound effect on the facility. So this is not neutral. When COVID-19 comes to a facility it affects staffing and reducing the impact of COVID-19 on our facilities is good for dealing with staffing and that's one of the reasons why these are such important steps to take. Dr. Henry has said about 5% now, it's down, 7% we recall on October 20th when we provide the statistics first, it's 5% now in interior health. In Providence Healthcare it's 1% and in, in the majority of the health authorities it's 1 or 2% of uh, healthcare workers who are not, who are currently unvaccinated and on leave without pay. But uh, what we're doing is adjusting, and I laid out in detail, Camille, uh, some of the responses, some of the challenges we faced. And, and essentially, in spite of that, in spite of those challenges, we're performing the thousands of surgeries, both urgent and non-urgent scheduled surgeries and emergency surgeries every day, and all the other services that the healthcare system provides. So it's not easy. But, it all, uh, but, um, but I'll have to tell you that uh, um, if you want to see the cause of the challenge, cause of the challenge is COVID-19. And this is an important step to deal with it and keep our, keep our seniors, our residents, and our patients safe. Next question, Victor Kaiser, Radio NL. Hi, Dr. Henry and uh, Minister Dix. I just wanted to, uh, to talk about events a little bit more this time outdoor, not indoor like last time. Uh, I know uh, our downtown BIA was hoping for uh, some kind of uh, approval one way or the other on a Santa Claus parade later this month. They do have the approval now from Interior Health. Uh, so I guess the question really would be is the fact that we heard one thing from the Ministry of Health saying that they could go ahead with a communications plan for a long time, but then Interior Health was saying something totally different at the same time. Uh, so in, in situations like this, when people are hearing two different things from essentially a health officials, uh, what should they do? Who should they listen to? And in situations like that, again, who should people follow uh, when it comes to the province or Interior Health? Yeah, so Interior Health and my colleagues in Interior Health are the people who have the local jurisdiction. Uh, I think there was in that case, and uh, I've had conversations with my colleagues, I think there was a misunderstanding from another agency, or, um, particularly there was a couple of uh, uh, outdoor unstructured events like that where it is, uh, you know, Santa Parade where it's uh, very low risk where people can stay away from each other outdoors, etc. So uh, I, I know that's been clarified and I think that's really important, particularly as we're coming up to November 11th and there can be small outdoor ceremonies. Although I will say to people, um, be aware, and we talked about this just a, a few minutes ago with uh, Richard Zisman's question, um, older people particularly 
particularly the vets that we know now are in that older category and we need to make sure that it's safe for them um, and it may be uh, good for uh, many people to be able to do this remotely this year in the small group with the with their close uh, vaccinated family or, or friends rather than getting together in larger groups so uh, I think outdoor events like that are, are very low risk and we encourage them Victor, do you have a follow-up? I, I do, yes, uh, and appreciate that answer there, Dr. Henry. And uh, curiously, I know with the, the outbreak at Royal Inland Hospital now here in Kamloops, it's the fourth outbreak uh, the, with 19 cases. I guess this would make it the uh, the second worst in the entire pandemic. The first, of course, the first outbreak, of course, being the worst. Uh, wondering if you can shed some light as to how uh, it potentially might have, uh, you know, happened now that, I guess, uh, staff that are unvaccinated or on leave and things like that, if you're able to, to shed some more light as to how that could have happened. I don't have all of the details around that specific outbreak, but we do know that it, there are um, people who are in hospital who are not recognized as having COVID and unfortunately can transmit to people um, before it is recognized. So those are all things that we need to uh, bear in mind. And that's why it is still important, even with vaccination of staff, um, that we follow infection control precautions and testing and other things. And then keep a, a low index of suspicion for um, people who have certain symptoms that might be related to COVID. So I know it can happen. And even with fully vaccinated healthcare workers, we know that sometimes there's breakthrough and they may not get sick uh, very ill themselves, but it can still be transmitted. So we still have to have in place in these higher risk settings, um, other precautions as well. But we also have seen that um, where we have high, uh, that sort of firewall of, of most people being vaccinated or at least all staff being vaccinated that the uh, the rate of growth of outbreaks and uh, how many people they affect is much much less and that these outbreaks come under control much more rapidly next question lisa used city news hi there dr henry Regarding these pockets of areas where the cases remain high and the vaccinations remain low, some other reporter asked earlier this week, like, what's up with the interior and what's up with the eastern part of Fraser Valley? What more can be done? And I'm, I'm particularly thinking of this ahead of, you know, trying to get kids in to be vaccinated in the 5 to 11-year-old group. What more can be done to break down these barriers between, you know, science and people who are scared of it? Yeah, you know, really good question. Things that we think about every day. And it, it continues to be the same issues for the majority of people. It's around confidence in the vaccine, um, confidence in the information that they get. And there are many different ways that we try and address that. We've had town halls, we've met with elected leaders, we've met with faith leaders um, to try and make sure we're countering some of the misinformation, so incorrect information, but also Disinformation, and that is a that's a challenging thing. The 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 intentional uh, wrong information that's being spread by some people um, to to increase people's uh, resistance or, or fear of, of vaccination. So we're doing work on that, and we've um, been talking to parents about what types of information and and what types of settings are important for them in terms of younger children being immunized. But we still need to address the uh, the confidence that people have across the board. The other one is convenience, and I still hear this from people, that they wanted to get their vaccine, but they didn't know where to go, or they didn't, uh, it wasn't available right away in their community when they wanted it. So we're trying to address that. That's a very challenging one, and especially in some rural communities. Um, and, you know, making making sure that it is available for people. And and then there's the complacency factor. So the, the this thought that this virus is, um, is only affecting older people, it's not going to affect me, I don't know anybody that's been affected by it, uh, my immune system is strong and I'll be fine. And I think that is important. We all need to do those things that keep our, our bodies healthy and strong, whether it's sleep and eating well and exercising, 
but we are seeing with the strain of virus that's circulating now, and I showed that in the, the data today, that young healthy people can have severe illness with this virus. So we need to overcome that sense of invincibility and complacency that people have. And uh, we're trying to do that as well. But those are really the main factors. There's a very small group of people that are really truly anti-vaccine. And we hear as well that people have this um, feeling that it's being uh, forced upon them and it's all about freedom of choice and and to them I'll say it really is about us being part of a community and working together to uh, the common foe which is this virus that has affected all of us across the board some more than others and some people have suffered immense losses and you know but all of us really need to collectively do our part to help protect those we love and those we don't know. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? Just an aside, it's like you need a 1-800 dial a shot for people who need the convenience and show up at the door. Um, with children, looking at the dip that happened in mid-October after the mask mandate was instituted, I'm wondering, is that what precipitated that, that dip after the spike? And heading into get, going after that same age group to get their shots, what are some of the biggest challenges you see ahead? Yeah, you know, I, I think the mask mandate is an important consideration across the board. But if you notice, we've broken it down by 5 to 8 and then the 9 to 11. So those are the, the two age groups of school-age children who are not yet eligible for vaccination. And we had the mask mandate in 9 to 11, but not the 5 to 8. And you see that, that they pretty much followed the same trajectory. So I, I think it is one of the measures that is important when people are in a school setting, but it also reflects to us that the transmission to children reflected the transmission in their families, in their social connections, in their in their groups that they, uh, they were with both in school and outside of school in particular and in the communities they were in. And we saw that when you, you look at it, particularly by, uh, by health authority even. So it, there's many different factors that go into um, uh, who gets infected and when. But for children, we know the most important thing we can do to protect them is to be have everybody else around them uh, protected through vaccination, whether it's their older siblings, their family, uh, the groups that they're with. Uh, it, it, what are the challenges we see in, in 5 to 11? I think there's a couple of, of challenges. We've been talking to parents about this, about what are the things and what we see in, in, in BC, and there's been some stats shown around the country that, uh, you know, 50 to 60 percent of parents are really anxious to get their, their younger children immunized and are going to do it right away. And they're the ones that have the information, the knowledge, they, they uh, strongly feel that uh, it is the right thing for their child. There are about 20 percent of parents who, who have a lot of questions and they, want to have those answered before they uh, um, commit to having their children immunized. And I think that's really important and that, that is something that we need to address. We need to know the safety data and Health Canada is looking at independently all of the data from uh, right now Pfizer who's providing, uh, who's uh, developed the vaccine that is first in line to be approved for use. And we are confident that we have a very strong process for assessing safety and effectiveness of, of vaccines and uh, Health Canada. We rely on them to do that. So that's the, the one big important step. But then we need to make it um, we need to, uh, parents to understand the impact it's going to be on their on their children, whether there's side effects, what those side effects are likely to be, um, how comfortable are they in the clinic, uh, making sure we have immunizers that know how to um, to provide immunizations and comfort level to children, uh, especially younger children. So those are all things that we're doing a lot of work on to make sure that we have the right environment and we have the people who can answer questions for parents so they they can make those choices for their children. Um, I also think uh, I've heard from, from uh, people in my life that, uh, that, there's, uh, that there's two types, of, there's two other things that I, I find um, that we will need to think through. One is um, parents who find it really challenging that they can protect themselves but they can't protect their children directly and they are very anxious to have vaccines for, for younger uh, children so that they 
they don't get sick. And, and though, thankfully, most young children don't get very severe illness with this, some do. And they can pass it on to others in their family. So it is really important that we take that into consideration. And of course, there are other parents who are saying, well, I'm doing everything I can by protecting myself, and I'm not sure I'm ready for my child to be immunized yet. So those are also a valid um, opinions that we'll need to make sure we have the, the information, particularly about safety of the vaccine, about what are the potential side effects, and um, all the information that we have from around the world about um, how well it works in, in younger people. So it's, um, you know, I think confidence in the vaccine is something that we take really seriously. And we have some great uh, vaccine experts here in BC and in Canada, and we're working with them to make sure we have all the information that parents need to make that decision. Our last question today goes to Belle Peary, CBC. Please go ahead. Hi there, and of course, if we could have answers in English and French, please. So we're looking at today's presentation, and the three projections have a reproductive number of just below one or slightly over one. Does that mean there's no longer a plan to try to get case numbers to fall below current levels? And if not, why not? No, oh, absolutely not. I mean, obviously, we want uh, case levels to go down. Um, we know that a percentage of people who are uh, who are infected with this virus end up in hospitals. So hospitalizations are a lagging indicator. So absolutely, but all of the things that we're doing are the things that are making a difference in in case numbers coming down. Case numbers don't tell the whole story, though, especially day-to-day -day case numbers. What we need to look at is the rolling average over time and the testing rates that we have. And that's one of the things that I presented. We've been doing a lot of testing across the board in many different uh, age groups and particularly in younger children. So we are finding more cases. And when we have clusters or outbreaks, we do a lot of testing around that cluster or outbreak. So we are finding more cases in highly vaccinated uh, groups of people. But the good news is, as we are investigating every single case and public health is talking to these people, the 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 difference that we're seeing is people who are vaccinated are so much less likely to end up in hospital or have severe illness. So those are all the things that go into the case numbers and absolutely we want the case numbers to come down. But more importantly, we want people with severe illness to be protected. We want people to be protected from severe illness and for our hospitalizations, ICU cases to come down too. Je peux dire que Bell, que ce que le docteur Henry vient de dire, c'est que il y a plusieurs éléments importants. Bien sûr, le nombre des cas, la transmission de COVID-19 dans la communauté est très important, et on voit ça dans le nombre euh, reproductif euh, de, de, de l'épidémie actuellement, qui est à peu près moins d'un. Ce qui est important, ce qui euh, euh, suggère une diminution des cas euh, dans les semaines à venir. D'autres choses étant égales, et euh, ces choses ne sont pas toujours égales, n'est-ce pas? Donc, euh, cette question de la transmission est importante, mais aussi la question de l'hospitalisation, ce qui est très important, surtout, bien entendu, pour moi, en tant que ministre de la Santé, c'est-à-dire que le nombre de gens à l'hôpital, Actuellement, euh, à peu près euh, 400, 450, euh, actuellement, 430, actuellement, est euh, trop élevé dans la mesure où il y a d'autres questions pour nos hôpitaux, bien, entre, bien sûr, n'est-ce pas? Donc, on veut cette question des maladies sévères et essentielles dans nos considérations, par exemple, pour, pour des mesures Dans, à l'intérieur de la province. Donc, c'est une question d'hospitalisation, c'est une question de, de cas, de ce qui représente le nombre euh, reproductif et d'autres choses. Donc, on voit tous et on a vu ça pendant cette présentation, c'est-à-dire qu'il y, euh, y a des bonnes nouvelles dans les mesures où on voit une diminution en général 
euh, des cas depuis quelques semaines. Mais en même temps, le défi dans nos hôpitaux est, est, est tout à fait difficile à l'heure actuelle. Donc, il faut considérer tous ces éléments, éléments et ce que c'est ce que le, la Dr. Henry fait et nous faisons euh, à la ministre de, de la Santé. Belle, do you have a follow-up? Um, on the daily case counts, so the numbers that are reported, um, how many of the people who are being diagnosed uh, with COVID for a second time are in that group? You know, is the data being collected about repeat cases of COVID and Are, are people who get the virus more than once counted as a new daily case count? <laughs> the, the shorter, the, the answer to the last part is yes. Um, and the answer to the first part is not really. Um, we do, we can retrospectively look at people who have had two incidents of, of COVID um, a certain period of time apart. And we have done that uh, periodic analysis. Um, it is an important question. We also are looking at, you know, what's the, the community level risk, um, which is a combination of how much, how many people have been infected versus and how many people are protected through uh, through vaccination. So one of the ways we've been looking at that over time is by a serology study and we've just uh, the bccdc has uh, uh, done the the i think the fifth time we've done a, a, a period in time a snapshot of of the percent of people who have uh, serologic evidence of a previous infection or from vaccination and we can tell the difference between having immunity from vaccination and having immunity from previous infection so uh, hopefully we'll have those, those data to, to um, publicly very soon um, I will say though that it, this is a really important question because I hear all the time um, that uh, you know post infectious immunity is better than vaccination and and I've said this also uh, a couple in the last couple of weeks there has been a number of studies small studies that show that yes people who are um, uh, who are so I think we all agree that, uh, that for a period of time after infection most people have immunity but that varies it varies depending on your own immune system it de varies depending on how severe the infection was some people who have very mild infection it doesn't stimulate the cell mediated response of their immunity <laughs> i don't know you probably won't don't need to translate all of this but um <laughs> but and then some people um who have very severe infections, their immune system gets overwhelmed and if they re recover, they may not have um, strong immune protection for a long period of time. And we know that it varies how long that protection from an infection lasts. And uh, just this week, there was a very good study came out of the United States looking at on a population basis in one of their HMOs, so hundreds of thousands of people. And it looked at people who were infected with, with COVID and people who, uh, um, so all of them had previous infection. Uh, some of them were vaccinated as well. And the risk of having infect a second infection was five times higher in people who were not vaccinated than people who were vaccinated. And their risk of hospitalization was even higher than that. And I can't remember off the top of my head, it was like 10% higher. So wh what we've shown is that uh, compared to vaccinated people, unvaccinated people, your risk at the same age group of, of being infected is about 10 times higher. For those who've had previous infection, it's not that high, but it's at least five times higher if you've not yet been vaccinated. So it again is more and more evidence that vaccination, even after infection, is an important measure to prevent you from getting infected again um, and to have a stronger, longer lasting immune response um, that we know is effective for a longer period of time and against a wider variety of the strains that are circulating. So these are, this is why it is still very important for people who have had a previous infection to be vaccinated. And I know this is a, a source of contention for many people, but it is your best protection because we can, there's no way of measuring um, effectively the cell media immunity, that, that memory cell response um, that some people develop uh, after infection and some people don't. And we know that it, uh, the vaccine effectiveness we get from vaccines is very strong and longer lasting. 
Sorry. <rire> ah. Premièrement, que oui, tous les cas sont, sont dans le compte. C'est-à-dire que si on a testé positif ou a, a eu un test positif euh, pendant, disons, euh, 2020, et on a un test positif, disons, aujourd'hui, on compte chaque fois. Ça, ça c'est la première chose. Euh, la deuxième chose, c'est qu'on fait des études sérologiques euh, périodiquement donc, au BC Center for Disease Control et on va euh, pouvoir partager ces résultats bientôt. Mais ce qui est important dans, dans euh, ce que la Dr. Henry vient de dire, c'est que même si on a eu un test positif pour COVID-19, si on a vivé avec COVID-19, on est plus protégé, de loin, si on est vacciné. Et la vaccination est essentielle pour tout le monde. Ça, c'est ça c'est en sommaire ce que le Dr. Henry, le Dr. Henry vient de dire. C'est soutenu par l'évidence et ce qu'il faut faire. Donc, dans toutes les catégories, même si la risque peut-être n'est pas autant pour une ou l'autre, il est absolument essentiel d'être vacciné pendant une pandémie où ceux qui ne sont pas vaccinés sont à grand risque actuellement, 50 fois plus à risque d'être hospitalisé si on n'est pas vacciné. Et c'est ça qui est essentiel. C'est ça, ça qui est important pour tout le monde. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much.